Okay, so hello everybody. Thank you for waiting and thank you for coming. I know it's the last session of the conference and you're always a little bit sleepy at the end of conferences. So um, today I will present you um, Applying FP Patterns. I'm Markus Haug from Codecentric in Germany. And to start off, functional programming has become more and more popular. And there are some patterns in functional programming that you can use even if you are not fully sold for functional programming. So you're doing OO in your day-to-day -day job. But then there are still some patterns that you might want to use even if you're not doing fully FP. So today I will show you two of those patterns, namely monoids as the first one and better error handling as the second one. But first let's start with some toys. So here we have some, something that is called Duplo, which is something children play with. And you can see here a construction site that has some um, vehicles like a crane. And you see this is built of building blocks. And those building blocks tend to be rather big and they are kind of special because for example for the crane, this part here can only ever be used as a crane. It wouldn't make sense to attach it to like the LKV here. And on the other side, you have another set of those toys and it's meant to be an airport and there's a plane and the plane consists of like only two specialized building blocks again. So if you want to reuse those building blocks, it would be very hard because it's an airplane. Okay, so enough of, du of Duplo, let's go to Lego. So if you build something with Lego, you again have building blocks, but they tend to be much, much smaller. So for example, on the left-hand side, you have a building, the Oprah in Sydney, which consists of many thousands of those small blocks. And on the right-hand side, you have the Tower Bridge, which also consists of those blocks. And actually, if you look at the individual blocks, they are not that much different. So here we have lots of small blocks, and less of those special case huge blocks that don't fit anywhere else. Okay, so to summarize, Duplo tends to favor large specialized building blocks, and they tend to be too big and cannot be reused. On the other hand side, we have the Lego part, where we have small composable building blocks that can be community reused, so we can build the Opera or the Tower Bridge with almost 80% of the same stones. And um, you have uh, let loss of, uh, less of specialized building blocks, so we have more reuse. So why am I talking about toys here? We are at a tech conference. In my opinion, OO tends to be more like Duplo. You have lots of small parts that you can compose, but they tend to not fit anywhere else. So if you think of the Gang of Four pattern, if you have like the adapter pattern there and the um, decorator pattern there, they tend to fit in this special use case, but it's not easy to reuse them somewhere else if you rebuild uh, your software. And on the other hand, we have functional programming, where the building blocks or the functions tend to be smaller and more reusable. And they tend to fit almost everywhere if you reconstruct your software. So that's why we talk about FP today. So let's start with our first pattern, which is called monoids. So the intuition for monoids is they are meant to be used to combine stuff. And you can create values from thin air, which a method uh, provided by monoid, which is called empty. And you can combine two values with the monoid.combine operation, or also here as a pipe plus pipe operator, which can be used in fix. I will use them in some of the example slides. And in addition to those two methods, there are also some laws. And laws are meant to prevent buggy implementations. And for monoid, there are only three laws, like for example, if you have the empty element of a monoid and you use the infix operator to combine it with another element of the monoid, you want to get back the, uh, the non-empty element again. And this holds for both uh, the right side and the left side. And there's a third law, which is called, it has to be associative, which means it does not matter in which order you group the parentheses and evaluate the expression, it's always the same result. Okay, so keep this a little bit in mind, it will become important later on again. So here we normally implement monoid as a type class, and we do this by defining a trait called monoid with a type parameter A that defines our empty method returning a value of type A, and our combined method that takes two values of type A and will result in a value of type A again. So now that we have this type class and there's some hidden sugar to, always, uh, to also provide the infix operator that I do not show on the slide, but um, this is actually just an alias for the combine and infix operation. And now we can define an instance of this type class for integers. 
And for integers, we say that the empty method returns zero, and the combined method just uh, adds the two sides that we pass in. Okay, so far so good. We can now use our monoid. For example, if we say monoid of int, and then call empty on it, we get the zero back as expected. We can, con we can call combine on it to add one and two to get three back. We can use the infix operator. So just to show you that this is uh, in later on slides what is behind the one um, pi plus two. And we can also, um, according to the laws, add empty on the right hand side and we'll get back 42 again. And what's also interesting uh, as a use case for monoids, because monoids and folds love each other very much, is that you can have a list of uh, integers and you can fold it. And what's the start value? Well, how about using the monoid.empty for this? And for the combine operation, you can use the monoid combine. So you can use the int monoid, pass it into fold left, and you will get back the sum of the values of the list. Okay, so this is one possible instance, the, in, the, uh, the integer with addition. You can also have integer with multiplication where the empty element is the one and combined is multiplication. You can also define some other monoids for integers like having min as the combined function, having max as the combined function, and actually also many collections um, like lists or vector or set are already monoids. Um, and so let's see some more example. So as I said, collections are monoids and it's even um, independent of the type parameter. So whatever A that is, we don't care, a list is a monoid where the empty value is the empty list and the combined function just concatenates those lists. Okay, our um, lovely function type, function one from A to B is a monoid if the result type, the B, is a monoid. And it, this works by having the empty element as the identity function and the combined function is composition. So <coughs> this is another example of a monoid that is not standard. Then tuples are also monoids and this actually um, generalizes to tuples of arbitrary length up to 22. <laughs> and <coughs> you can, um, this is monoid if both components or all components are monoid. And this just works by combining component-wise, so you combine all A's together if you have two tuples and the two B's. Future of A is a monoid if A is a monoid. And this works by, um, com by combining the two futures, waiting until they've both completed, and then combining the values using the underlying monoid. Continuing with uh, some more monoids, um, map of AB is a monoid if the value type is a monoid by combining the value types. And this is a little bit more tricky. So if you have, for example, um, our int monoid in scope and the, you define the, int mono, the monoid for map, then you can combine two maps as shown here, where you have the keys are strings and the values are integers. And you combine m1 and m2. And what this does is it will look at the keys of both maps. If the key occurs in both, like a's here, you will use the underlying monoid instance that is in scope for integer to add those two, so we get A's mapped to 42. And if the key is only in one of the maps, like B's or C's, we will just use this as is. Okay, so the nice thing now is firstly there are a lot of monoids and it's not hard to define some. And um, the other nice part is that they compose, like Lego building blocks. So let's build um, a rather huge monoid. So this is not probably one that you want to use as is in your um, application code, but it serves the demonstration purpose of what you can do with monoids because the building blocks fit together like Lego. So let's start with an innocent function that goes from config to any type A. So as we've seen previously, this is a monoid as long as the value type is a monoid. So let's, reply, uh, let's replace A with, for example, a future of A. So this is still a monoid. And future of A is a monoid, if A is a monoid, so let's go on with this. And this is also, of course, a monoid again. We can go on and we can replace a string, uh, we can replace the A again with a tuple, and if we want, we can replace one of the components of the tuple with an option, and the other hand side with a set. And this is still a monoid, and we don't have to define anything else, it just works. 
So now we have a function that goes from config to uh, exosynchronous um, operation that produces a map that goes from string to tuples of sets and options. And if you combine two values of these, the modern instance will just combine them. Okay. So now I'm, I, I've come here and saw, thought that um, we will apply some patterns, but up until now I just show you some theories, some laws, and what modernists are, but not what we can do with them other than building this huge thing. So let's go about using Apache Spark for it. And the use case is we want to analyze a potentially huge text, and we want to calculate some metrics over the words. So for example, we want to get the total word count in the text. We want to get the total char count, maybe the minimum and the maximum word length, probably something else like the average word length, and many, many more, because a requirements tend to change. So our goal is that we want to do only a single traversal over the complete text. And we want to have easy composition, which means that if we change our metrics, uh, or the things that we're going to calculate from our text, our program should be easily adaptable without rewriting the whole thing. Okay, so I don't know if you know Spark, but um, in Spark um, there's this called the resilient distributed data set type which represents your collection. And this uh, RDD has uh, the method fold. And as I said before, monoids and fold are a perfect fit, even if Spark does not talk about monoids at all. And if you look at the documentation of this, there are some words that we have seen previously, like given an associative function and a neutral zero value. Okay, zero value, that sounds suspicious like our monoid.empty. And associative function is just the law that says that our monoid.combine has to be associative. So we could use as, uh, as the zero value our monoid empty and as the op our combined function. Okay, let's, let's write an implicit class that wraps this nicely up for us. And we define a method called combine that requires our monoid instance for our type. And we just, as I said uh, previously, we just pass in m.empty for the fold and m.combine for the uh, step operation. Okay, so having this in place, we can write now our program. And it will be very short. Actually, it fits on one slide if I omit some of the Spark context setup. So we have our Spark context and our file path. Then we call Spark context.txt file to read it and to read the file and through the RDDs. We then split this into words because it will only be a string. And then we map over all the words with our expand function, and that is where the action happens. And our expand function looks very innocent because given a word, it produces a three tuple of a one the length of the word shows the number of chars, and a map from the word to one again. And at the end, what we can get when we call data.combine, we'll get back a three tuple with a word count, the char count, and a word map which goes from a word to its a count of occurrences in the text. Easy, right? So let's see how this works. We have the text Scala.io, the Scala event in France. So we read this in via the Spark context, and we split it into words. So we get back an RDD. I replace it with a seek here for uh, demonstration purposes, and so that more fits on the slide. And we will get uh, the word Scala I.O., the Scala event in, and so on and so forth. So we map over this, and with, for each word, we replace it with our three tuple, which is what our expand function does. So for each word, we have a one at the first component, then a five for the chars for Scala, and a map that goes from Scala to one for, for the Scala word. So we do this for each word. And then remember that we are in a fold, so um, the fold at the end will do, uh, will do the reduce of the monoid values, and the monoid value here for the three tuple will combine the components, so it will collapse all ones into uh, one, part of the th uh, three tuple, it will sum up all chars, and it will combine all the maps. So at the end, we will get something like seven, because there are seven words in our text, 28, because there are 28 chars, and we get back our map, which combines the values via the monoid instance, which in our case is plus. So we get back like Scala occurs two times, IO occurs one time, and the occurs also one time. 
Okay, so this, is our, this was our whole program and now we want to change it. So we slow out the old matrix and we only leave the word count in because everybody does word count, so we definitely want to do that. And we swap in a four tuple where we have as the second component the maximum, the, then the minimum, and at the end another map. So the maximum here is another monoid that I didn't show, but the combined function, as I said in one of the slides, will choose the maximum value of the two uh, opera operations, and the min will do this for the minimum. So if you combine um, max of the int, which is, for example, max of 7 and max of 9, then we will get back max of 9. And now th the rest of the program is actually the same as before. We call data.combine, but now we just get back a four tuple with our results. And this is all we have to change to swap metrics. We can also use whatever monoid we like. We could use in future or whatever we want. And we can do this for our text again. We split it into words, and then the, map fun the expand function is a little bit different. <coughs> and again, we combine those uh, components into one value. So at the end, we get something like seven words again. The maximum word length is six. The minimum word length is two. And we get back a map. And this time, it goes from number of uh, chars to the words that have so much chars. For example, um, Scala and Event both have five chars. OK, so this was a quick demo of what you can do with, with monoids. Um, there are some more tricks you can play with them. You can, for example, filter out some words by returning the empty value. So you can say, if it starts with an uppercase, return monoid.empty, and then it will be uh, not counted, for example, in the word count. And actually, everything that does map and reduce is a perfect fit for monoids, because you map into the monoid, and you reduce using the monoid.combine. And then there's also um, a nice data structure called finger trees which you can Google if you want. And um, the special thing is that it changes what that structure presents by the choice of its monoids. So you can plug in a special sort of monoid, and then it gets a random access list. Or you can use another monoid, and it becomes a priority search queue, all with the same finger tree, which is quite cool, I think. And there's also a nice functional Perl paper, if that interests you, by Prent Jorge, which uses uh, monoids as the base of a whole um, vector dia the vector graphics library in Haskell. OK, so that's uh, for now all of about monoids, and we will continue with another pattern. And this is about arrows. So traditionally, in, in Java, we have this try, catch, finally. And um, we have checked exceptions, which had a good idea uh, in the past, because they were meant to uh, make the compiler more helpful such that a programmer does not forget to, chain, to check for errors. And um, they also ma were meant to reduce value checking. Like if you, say, if you have to check if it's null or if an error occurred, um, you don't want to have to do this. And uh, um, by now, everybody agrees that it was a bad idea, but the idea was good. So the other part is unchecked exceptions. Um, so the bad about unchecked exceptions is that they are only visible via the docs if you are lucky enough to have docs, or if the, you are lucky enough that the docs document different errors, which is not always the case. And um, currently, this is the way to go in Java. And what do you do in, in Java when you have thrown an error? Well, you turn null or some custom class. And because programmers are lazy, more often than not, they will return null, which results in che null checking. So in Scala, there are not even any checked exceptions. We only have unchecked exceptions. But from a functional programming point of view, those, even this is unnecessary. Because instead, we want to have um, exceptions in the type, and we want to have them as first class values. And both of this is not given by the try catch finally in Java. So out of a box in Scala, there is the ISO type and the try type for this to represent exceptions or errors. And um, both have a share of problems, because currently, at least in Scala 2.11, um, either is not write biased, and um, tries not even law for monad, and you cannot even choose when it will catch exceptions. It will just catch anything. It's like a try-catch uh, throwable, which is not something you want to do. 
And um, to get the most of this, so you have to currently use a functional programming library like Scala Z or CATS. Okay, let's first look at an example. Um, we have a convert function here that takes a list of strings and it maps over this and does a to int on the string. And to int uh, lies about exceptions because it tells you nothing about exceptions. Also, you might have an idea that this will not always work, but the type structure doesn't tell you that. So let's pretend we don't know that and we pass in something like convert of one, two, three, hello world, five. So this will crash. I know that the form will probably be too small, but it will throw a number format exception. And if you don't, if you didn't expect this, you will be surprised by this. Okay, so what do you do? Well, let's uh, wrap it in a try catch. And now the, the thing is, we have only one choice. If one of those values here produces an exception, we will return the control flow to the catch clause, and we will not process the remaining elements. And still the type says nothing about the errors. And we have only the option to fail fast, as I said. So what if we want to get all errors and show all of them? For example, if we had one, two, three, hello world, five, foo, bar, there's also uh, two more values that will fail. And maybe we want all of those errors instead of just failing after hello world. And we cannot do this with try catch because it doesn't compose. So it's like a Duplo building block, like, like the airplane, it can be used there where it fits, but, not, but nowhere else. OK, so let's continue with a different example, and um, we will model password validation. And we have some constraints on, on the password, like the minimum length is 8, or maybe it has to contain at least one number. It may not contain spaces, which is a questionable constraint, but we will go with it. And for example, other ones are possible too, like it has to contain at least one uh, upper chart. I'm sure you all know some forms that require those kind of things. And so we start to model this with an uh, algebraic data type that represents our possible error cases. So for example, we have one for password is too short, and we have one for password contains no space, and of course more for the other constraints. Then we define our check method that does the actual check, and the return type is an option of our error. So either it will produce an error or not. And then we have our login method that uses XOR, which is just the either from cats in this case, but you can just read it as an either. And it will use a for comprehension and will first do the check that does uh, the length check, then the space check. And if all of those succeed, we want to create a token. Okay, so how will this work in practice? The user will, uh, pass in some, uh, will pass in some text and for example, cabbage, and we say, sorry, the password must be more than eight chars because the first constraint fails. Okay, so he tries again, he enters bold cabbage, and then the first one succeeds, but the second one will uh, fail. And says, sorry, the password must contain at least one digit. And the user will try again because he really wants to log in or to register, and it will enter a digit into this password like one bold cabbage, and only then he will see the error that it also doesn't uh, contain spaces, which we could have shown here, but because we didn't ever get to that check, we uh, didn't have the chance to show it. And at the end, he might get a little bit frustrated and more look like this, because who knows how many constraints there will be, and he's just typing uh, one by one until it checks. Okay, so what's our scenario? We have multiple unrelated um, <coughs> error conditions, and the result is either failing or success. And just like try catch, either and XOR and friends that are named differently are made for fail fast. So we haven't gained that much other than tracking our errors at the type level. But the nice thing is that we can swap out our XOR or either for another type, for example, validated or validation, depending on which library you use. So we remain, we let the code be the same as previously we have our um, algebraic data type with error conditions and our check methods as before. And we have, oh yeah, I didn't talk about the convert method, which is just to reduce the boilerplate such that it fits on the slide. And then we have our login method, but this time we um, convert our check length method and we use the monoid combine function to combine the results of our checks. So 
validated is also a monoid, which combines the errors into a non-empty list and otherwise returns the right one. So you can think of validated as either, uh, as either left with a list of errors or right with the success value. Okay, so as before, we do our checks and we then create our token if all checks were successful. And now we can use validated and we can have something like this where the user says login with cabbage and it will be a left or an invalid here with a non-empty list of all the errors that occurred. For example, the PV is too short and the password connects a digit and it didn't contain any special char. And so we can show the user uh, after the first input what is wrong. And so we can show a message like this, sorry, your password is too short and it contains no digit and it has no special characters. So we can also fix this, all of them and doesn't have to go through this fail fast series of checks. Okay, so at, at this point probably also the user will never say this, he will be cleared for you that he doesn't have to go all those checks separately. Okay, so we had uh, either and we had validated and there's uh, even a third type that you can swap in and it's called IOR um, and it's for a different scenario so we don't want to have multiple unrelated conditions and show all errors. We still want to fail fast but there are not only success and failure, but there are also warnings that we might ex be okay with and we want to continue, but show the warning at the end. For example, we emit a warning if the password is shorter than 10 chars because it's weak, but we still go with it. And uh, by f from functional programming, you can just swap in another type and use this as your error semantics. So this uh, shows that you can uh, swap in different building blocks because they all, all fit in there and you can uh, have different semantics based on that. Okay, so <coughs> this, is, uh, this, this was the first class errors pattern and um, the thing is we just replaced try catch with first class values, tracking the types, uh, tracking the errors in the type level, so it's such that you can see that they can occur. We can also swap either and XOR, for example, with validated and validation or for IOR and then we can swap out our semantics. So what I hope to show you today was that uh, functional programming has some really nice patterns for you, even if you don't do poorly functional programming, and you can even use them in your uh, day-to-day work. So for example, you can use monads to combine stuff or um, count words with Spark, and you can do functional error handling without user frustration. Okay, so because it's late, I cut the presentation obviously a little bit, so enough said, enough with Duplo, it's time to play with Lego. Thank you for your attention. Are there any questions? I think we have more than enough time. I expect at least a performance question, otherwise you won't be able to leave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what's, good question. What is the performance? So. For the, for the Spark one, I actually tested this and I wrote uh, two different versions, one using the monoid one and the other one just using it, doing it by hand and putting in the right caches there such that we don't have multiple traversals of the graph, of the, of the text. And of course, the monoid version is a little bit slower because it does more allocation, but it's actually almost as fast as the handwritten version. But, and it's, but it's still much more composable and you can swap out your metrics on the go, which is something you cannot do if you write it by hand. But good question, yeah. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes. Okay, so the, the question is, is it easier to refactor code with a lot of monoids? Yeah, it depends on what you want to refactor. Um, in my example, where you just want to swap out the metrics, it's really easy because you just replace your tuple with something else that is a monoid. So in that case, it's really simpler. Yeah. But it tends to get a little bit more involved with the um, either validated and IO part. Yes, another question. Um, actually, Actually, no, because validated is not a monad. Um, and that is because um, if you have the power of a monad, you cannot present all errors. 
So it can, by definition, not be a monad. So it's only an applicative if it says something to you, or you can use the monoid interface to combine the errors if you don't care about the, re the success value. Come again? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, good question. So actually, um, CATS, which also does a lot of, um, which th the question is, um, how do you validate the monoid laws? Or can you validate them? And the answer is that, for example, CATS or Scala Z um, apply Scala check for this. And so they instantiate your monoid and they do their properties that says, if I, for example, for the associative law, if I combine it in this order or in this order, it has to be the same one. And then you just let Scala check um, instantiate whatever, how many values you want and test the associative property. And it should check that uh, it's true. Of course, it's not 100%, but it's quite sure that this is then the case. And you can do this for any laws. Yeah. So the question was, how do you handle asynchronous validation? But I'm not sure what the problem is with asynchronicity there. Oh, yeah. OK. So. The question is, uh, how do you handle asynchronous validation? Because there might be a future inside the validated. So the answer is that there is even a transformer for this, but it's not a monad, then it's only an, applica an applica applicative. And the future is also an applicative, so we can use the applicative to compose those two and then use them as a validated of future and get the semantics with the errors. Okay, no more questions? Then thank you for your attention and have a nice evening.